Via telephone, the Speaker of the House in West Virginia, Roger Hanshaw. Speaker Hanshaw, good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, Rob. I'm doing well. It's been an interesting morning already. I've, I've heard about radon. I've heard the, the, the hosts kicking each other under the table. And now I've heard an admiral like it under a mole. It's been, it's been an interesting two minutes. And, and you didn't even get to hear the off-the-air stories that have been going on around here. My okay. Goodness. But you're welcome to join us. Come over some morning and enjoy off-the-air stories. They can be they're, they're embellished. <laughs> well, I have done that. I, I've been in your studios. I'd be happy to come do it again sometime. Yeah, so you know what they say about the Eastern Pan. And no matter where you are in the state, it's just a short drive to the eastern panhandle from there, Roger. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or not. I don't know. I was in Charleston uh, for our day at the public health day at the legislature there a couple odd weeks ago, and that wasn't such a small drive. That's a bit of a drive. It's, it's always a drive, and there's always construction. Always is, right? Hey, uh, the governor was busy signing some bills over the weekend, Roger, and I know that uh, when you have 134 people in the Capitol, uh, discussing what the next law is going to be and trying to find some agreement and compromise on it. You can never make everybody happy. But i got to tell you, uh, going into this session, I never saw you guys successfully tackling three major pieces of legislation, PEIA, tax cut, reorganization of DHHR, uh, in 60 days. Yet you got it done. And there were some factors in there, too, which included it seemed like the House and the governor were on, were on one speed and the Senate was on another But in the end, everybody came together and got some major pieces of legislation done. What was the key to that this session? Well, it was a big 60 days, Rob. You're right about that. And that's that's not even to mention some of the other really, really significant things that we got done that, that I'm convinced will pay dividends for the state for, for a generation. You know, beginning beginning next year, we're going to be – we're going to start a three-year phase in to put assistant teachers in every first, second, and third grade classroom in West Virginia in addition to all the things you mentioned. So mm-hmm. it, it, it was a big 60 days, and it was it was a good a, a good and productive session. You, you asked how we got there. I think it's always a confluence of circumstances. Robin, we're we're in a we're in an environment now in which we have historic budget surpluses thanks to a lot of people and a lot of a lot of factors that, that have all that have all sort of converged simultaneously here. So that's what's made a lot of it possible. You know, in, in thinking back over the nine years that I've spent in the legislature, my very first session, the very first year I arrived there in January twenty fifteen, we were faced with a five hundred million dollar budget deficit. Not a not a surplus, but a deficit. Our very first job was to was to figure out how to close a five hundred million dollar hole in state budgets, and now we're sitting here with a with an opportunity to think about how we would use a budget surplus in excess of a billion dollars. So that really is what facilitated every conversation that we had about about tax cuts, about additional resources for education, about e- even the reorganization of DHHR, which which is a big deal and and is particularly important to to the most vulnerable population of the state. That that was facilitated in no small part because we're in an environment now in which we have the resources to spend. So uh, it, it's it, it's shared priorities. Uh, it, it's 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 a it's a commitment to making sure that we're doing what the people sent us there to do. And I, I, I wish I could give you something more concrete than that, but it really just comes down to a collection of shared priorities and having the resources available to, to, to bring them to reality. During the course of the interviews we did during the session, and we tried each and every day to have at least one elected member from the House or the Senate on this program, at least one, there were some personality conflicts that arose. And some of those, if not most, were between the House and the Senate. Were those conflicts overblown, heat of the moment sort of things, or were they real and things that had to be resolved in order to get this legislation passed? Oh, I don't know that we had any conflicts beyond the usual disagreements about policy and and the structure of government this year, Rob. I mean, I, I've, like I say, I've been there nine years, and I, I don't I don't know that we had anything out of the ordinary this year in terms of process. Um, of course, I mean every every legislative chamber is a living, breathing organism, right? I, I say to people every time I talk about it that that after every election cycle, the legislature reinvents itself. You you have the opportunity to bring in 
50 percent of the Senate as new members and the opportunity to bring in 100 percent of the House as new members. And, and we, we had that in no small part this year. We had 30 new members of the House this year. So when we convened in January, we had a 30 percent turnover in membership of the House in a single election cycle. That's huge. That's huge. And anytime you have that uh, a turnover of that magnitude, it, it causes the personality of the body to be different. And it takes a while to learn the new the personality of the new body, and the two bodies have to learn each other's personality. So I I personally didn't see or didn't witness anything beyond the usual growing pains of uh, of readjustment after every election cycle. Bill, uh, good morning, Mr. Speaker. Uh, good morning. Again, thanks for joining us. Uh, the accomplishments that you've mentioned ha- are broadly recognized and uh, and widely credited through the state. You you've had a very successful session. What did you not get done that you personally felt should have been done? Oh, there's a couple things we always want to keep working on, Bill. I mean, every time when you finish a legislative session, you always think about, okay, what should be different now? What do we want to make sure we're already focused on for for the, the, the next upcoming period? One of the things we, we left undone that we absolutely must get back to sooner rather than later is correcting the situation that we have in our correctional facilities. No pun intended there, but we do have a crisis on our hands with staffing of our correctional facilities. We literally have a state of emergency declared in which we, we have we have service members staffing our our correctional facilities providing security there so we, we weren't able to get that done this year to clock just ran out on us for that but we do have to get back to it sooner rather than later we have to we have to do so in a in a, in a way that recognizes I think that the even though we are a small state, it's a very diverse state in terms of what the regions of our state experience day to day. So life in the eastern panhandle of West Virginia is quite different than, for example, where I live. I, I live in the very center of the state. It's not at all uncommon for me to go weeks at a time without ever crossing the border of West Virginia. But yet, if I live in Martinsburg, you can cross the border four or five times a day just in the course of your daily life. So things are different in various parts of our state, even though we are a small state. So we have to, we have to be willing to recognize that. So that, that was left undone this year. And, and maybe one of the biggest heartbreakers came all the way down to the very last night of the session, and that was a proposal that we were working to provide some additional financial support to our local fire departments and EMS providers. We didn't quite get that one across the finish line, so that's one that I know is important to everybody. We've got to get back to that one, too. So Th- those are the two the two things that come first to mind, Bill. Well, I I, I was going to ask you about corrections, so let's uh, follow another follow up on that. Uh, on last Friday, uh, our talk around political talk around, uh, I mentioned some of the difficulties in the corrections, and it was pretty stark, uh, such as since last July, 375 uniform officers have started. 359 have resigned, uh, depending very heavily on National Guard. This is really unsustainable. Uh, there was a, a bill that was uh, a couple of bills that died in the House uh, toward the end. One would have given a $10,000 bonus over three years, uh, as well as $6,000 hiring and retention bonus. Uh, a Senate bill would have given an additional $10,000. Big numbers, but when you look at the forty million dollars that's been accrued uh, for overtime and National Guard, these are fairly uh, uh, fairly reasonable. Why did they die? How you said you ran out of time, uh, but you also said we're in a state of emergency. Uh, state of emergency, I would think that would would keep the spotlight on these, and I'm surprised that some action was not taken in the House. Well, so are we, and, and and frankly, that's one that we know we'll be back to. I'm confident we'll be back to it even before we get together in the next regular session. But one of the things that really focused or, or, or caused our our, our dis- decision process, Bill, to crystallize in the House as we began to think about correction officers this year was – what are what are the differences that we experience around the state among the various facilities that we have? So, what does a ten thousand dollar pay increase mean to to uh, one of, one of our correctional officer workers at a, at an Eastern Panhandle facility versus one of our facilities, say closer to where I might live? Uh, we we know we have different kinds of hiring pressures, and the concept of locality pay comes up every year. It came up again this year. We had that discussion this year. We had it in the context of do we provide additional flexibility for for payment 
structures to members of, of, of state government at every level, but particularly in, in our correctional facilities this year. And that, that conversation just, just, it, it didn't. It didn't reach a productive point. It, it needs to. It needs to. I, I have the opportunity in in my job to travel the state quite a lot, uh, more more so than than a lot of people do. I see the various portions of West Virginia, all the all the 55 counties, almost every year. And because of that, it's pretty easy for me to see the differences that that really our small state has from region to region. That's not as clear cut to people who don't make those trips as as often as sometimes I make them. So I think we do have to get back to that question of locality pay. I think it is I think it is real. I think it is I also think it's not it's not unheard of. You know, our federal government practices a similar structure. Depending upon where you live in the United States of America, your pay scale may be different depending upon just simply where you live. Uh, that that's not unheard of, and it probably is time that we we take that step here in West Virginia. It's not popular. It's not an easy decision to make, but I think it probably is necessary. We're told that's derisively called EP pay <laughs> in the capital, Roger. But, but you know, but that's that's not really true, Robin. I'll, I'll give you a specific example of why. So even even though uh, even though the the Eastern Panhandle faces a cost of living pressure that may not be true in other parts of West Virginia, you can think about some of some of our other counties and and the fact that they may demand locality pay for a completely different reason. You know, we have a correctional facility in Welch. We have a correctional facility in in McDowell County, West Virginia, and I don't know if you guys have been there. Lately, or if, or if you've ever been there at all, but mm-hmm. if you have, but I, I I go there a couple times a year for just the course of my regular job, and it's it's a part of West Virginia which whose economy has been really punched in the face by the downturn in our extractive industries. And as a consequence of that, they face a turnover pressure at that facility that's every bit as as serious as what you would face at an Eastern Panhandle facility. So the, the the turnover there is caused by a very different reason, but the turnover is nevertheless still significant. So does does that set of circumstances create a reality that demands locality pay? Yeah, and, and locality pay, as you're pointing out there, Roger, could be specific to the job as opposed to the the region. Oh, absolutely. I, th- I think that is the proper way to have that conversation. You know, we always it always seems to become geography centric when we talk about it. Uh, at least during the time I've been there in the legislature. But the more proper way to think about it, at least in my mind, is where do we have hiring pressures that are different from the the average in West Virginia? Where where is the pressure different, and and is it a problem that can be solved with money? Some problems can't be solved by money, but for the ones that can be solved with money, how do we solve yeah, you're putting a totally different uh, uh, definition to the locality pay, at least the one I've been thinking of, and it's a, it's broader and it's probably much more meaningful than the uh, the simple geographic locality pay that I'd previous been thinking of. I told you he was smart, Bill. Yeah, you he kept insisting smart. he wasn't. No. I told you he was smart. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, that's very obvious. <laughs> We're talking about you, Mr. Speaker, not Rob. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, that's yeah. obvious, too. <laughs> that's obvious, too. Uh, the, is there is there any real likelihood because of the deep divisions within the state and I think between the haves and the have-nots and what you have, I should get. Uh, is there any real likelihood, serious likelihood, that we'll be able to crack that locality pay nut, regardless of the definition of locality pay? Well, I don't know, Bill, but what I can tell you is this. I know that you you properly characterized it a few minutes ago when you said this is a crisis and it's unsustainable. And in my experience, there's there's nothing that there's no better there's no better way to crack an uncrackable nut than than with with an unsustainable crisis. And I, I don't say that flippantly or or to make light of the situation, but I do know that from time to time, when when governments or societies face problems that otherwise seem insurmountable, it it forces us to make decisions that we would have otherwise never put on the table. So uh, I think we're actually headed to that point. We're, as you said, relying on National Guards men and women to staff our correctional facilities. Now, that's not, that, that, that is not sustainable, uh, nor, nor, nor for that matter is it even an appropriate role for, it for, for our National Guard long term. So I, I, think, I think we have to crack it. I don't know how yet, but I think we have to. 
Bill Kearns. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Um, I um, had the opportunity to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, to be able to come to Charleston this year and, and speak with uh, many of you all. And, and initially, I was really concerned about our DHHR split because uh, as a director for public health for a long, long time, I was concerned that my staff were going to be split between different divisions and, and um, being that we have environmental health and clinical but I, my concerns were put at ease um, while I was there. But so I think it was a really good move um, because DHHR as a whole previously was just too broad ranged, and so I think narrowing it down is going to make things a lot better as we move towards the future. Um, and I, I also disagree with the declaration of Eastern Panhandle Pay. Um, I meet with uh, my colleagues all across the state. I know it's a it's a it's an issue. Um, but and, you did have to get some assistance for hiring nurses here. Bill. Yes, um, we had to. And I was going to speak about that. We had to actually um, because of a shortage in being able to attract um, staff, we had to actually end up getting a special hiring rates um, to be able to hire staff in. That's not real sustainable um, due to the funding not always increasing to be able to pay those higher rates um, but I also speak with um, individuals from DHHR who um, their caseworkers are they're short on caseworkers their uh, child protective services they only have so many workers there they're not able to get done what they need to and our county is growing leaps and bounds um, but similar those issues are across our state um, but um, I'm just wondering what 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 can we do uh, as a state to look at our you know our, our public workers um, whether they're within health departments and surely we've we've shown our uh, abilities throughout the pandemic um, but you know I'm having a hard time getting um, employees hired for even the special hiring rates I have for some of my positions because they can they can be hired right across the Maryland Virginia line um, making sometimes 10 20 thirty thousand dollars more and i've even had some of my staff that were hired at the state level making more than what we can pay here um because our budgets are are so set and it's not like we can uh get a whole lot of additional dollars from lo locally um our and we're blessed in in berkeley county that in morgan county that we have um we have um, good funding from our uh, county and our localities and municipality but what can health departments, what can DHHR, what can any of the employees of the state do to, to have some kind of confidence that they're going to be thought about for their salaries for the future? Well, I think a couple of points ring ring pretty clearly out of out of your question there. So for first, first, what what we're doing is the best we can do, and we're going to continue to do it. We're going to keep giving. We're going to keep giving salary raises. We're going to continue to do that for as long as we're able to do it. It's long overdue. We sh we, we we let our salaries go far too unadjusted for far too long and there's you, you could talk about all the various reasons why that may or may not have happened but i think you can see a demonstrated commitment on our part at least over the last several years now to keep ratcheting up state salaries as quickly and as, as high as we possibly can as quickly as we can but uh, at another level and and perhaps a more subtle answer to the question is that we've we've got to stop i think treating all treating all workers in lockstep so we have to we have to recognize that life in the northern panhandle of west virginia in suburban pittsburgh may may be different than life in another part of the state that doesn't face the same kind of cross border pressures it's a reality that we just simply have to recognize given the geography of the state of west virginia uh, if i if i'm remembering the data correctly 60% of west virginians live in a county that touches the border of another state and that reality just creates some some situations that that can't be ignored because we live in a country in which people have freedom of mobility right you can you can take a job in another state in an, in 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 a, in a place where you can easily and quickly get to another state so recognizing that we have to have salary flexibility and we have to have flexibility and benefits is important and it's it's not a it's not a realization that we as a state have historically made we've we've historically treated uh, in in an effort to be fair and in an effort to be equal we have treated those who are not similarly situated equally and 
as the consequence of that is that they aren't treated equally because the dollar doesn't buy the same the, – the, the purchasing power of that paycheck is different depending upon where you are in the state. So this this notion of locality pay can arise – on on two it's a, it's a bimodal curve right you you can have uh, you can have a need for locality pay in circumstances where the county is doing extraordinarily well as perhaps it might be in Berkeley County or you can have a need for locality pay in circumstances in which a community is doing extraordinarily poorly and one's not more important than the next it's just different do yeah. many states around us do locality pay have we done a study on that we have uh, so if you look all across the country and there's there's the 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 typical uh, 31 flavors of ice cream there on that there there are states that 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 do true lo- federal government style locality pay then there are other examples of something uh, one, one of our members has an interesting idea in which uh, in, in which we would use something akin to uh, to a military model in which the the base pay is the same, but the to put it in a military context, the the, the BAH is different depending upon where you are. So, lot so, lots of models are out there. We've just not settled on one yet. In regards to the PEIA solution this year and getting that mix back to eighty twenty. $2,300 pay raise was provided this year to try to uh, uh, offset some of the health insurance costs that will arise from the restoration of the 80-20 ratio. As the years go by, uh, will you be doing an adjusted raise every year based on what the cost of medical premiums increase will be by keeping that 80-20 split? Well, we want to keep doing salary increases as often as we can, as high as we can. Uh, and that That's not necessarily tied to any particular set of circumstances, Rob. We just want to keep increasing people's salaries because we need to. So separate and apart from what else that might be tied to, we recognize that we want to be competitive, and we've got to keep increasing the salaries of our state workers, our public school teachers, of our, our public service workers, uh, state members of the state police, uh, all, all all of the people who depend upon us for for a paycheck that work needs to be recognized so the the answer to your question is yes we want to continue ratcheting up salaries as quickly as we can but don't don't lose sight of why we made the changes we made to PEIA this year so this was a this was one of the bigger accomplishments we made this session i'm i'm actually quite proud of it because the net effect of that piece of legislation is to keep our PEIA program solvent and solid and stable for for another generation of state workers so one one of our members delegate Matt Rohrbach from Huntington said to to uh on the floor of the house what good is a benefit to you if i'm giving you a benefit you can't utilize and that's the situation that we were potentially facing with our PEIA program we 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 received testimony from physicians and from patients who were who were no longer being treated by physicians if their insurance was the PEI insurance program. So the the whole purpose of what we did this session was to make sure that those those state workers, those people who depend upon PEIA for insurance coverage in West Virginia were able to to have a a benefit that they could utilize here within the state of West Virginia long term. But with that with that change this year comes an obligation on our part to make sure that we don't get it lopsided again, that we don't lose sight of how we keep it structurally sound and what needs to happen to make sure we don't find ourselves uh, in, in an upside down situation once again 10 years down the road. So we're going to keep a close eye on that, but but in in as a part of that process, we're going to keep increasing salaries to the fullest extent we can, as often as we can. Do you have time for one more question? Me? Sure. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, let's extend that PIA uh, discussion to the DHHR. Uh, you had a, a major problem to HHR. All of us knew it. Uh, I saw it from my perspective. There were two solutions to it. One was to get proper management in charge of it, which probably would require big, 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 big bucks, probably more so than West Virginia could could be willing to afford. The other one was to take the approach you did, and that was divided into three discrete sections. Are you, in fact, just or let me back up, put it in a positive way. Uh, how are you going to ensure that these three discrete units do not have comparable problems as what the much larger parent organization had? 
do you have something in place that's going to monitor this on a regular basis and what's going to be the role of the legislators well fine fine question admiral and i'll i'll i'll, I'll answer it this way uh we're we have a multi multi-pronged approach to making sure that happens first of all we did the the i'll, I'll use the word trifurcation i'm not sure that's even a word but we 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 did the three-way split this year because we we took input from the professionals that 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 the governor's office hired the McChrystal group prepared a report for us that we took seriously and evaluated closely we also took testimony from frontline DHHR workers themselves as well as as uh, current and former leadership of DHHR and one of the things we found was that there were just way too many way too many levels of administration between the frontline worker who's responsible for one of one or more of our vulnerable populations and somebody who can actually make a decision. So one of the one of the ways we we have structured the the split to increase accountability is by decreasing the number of people between the frontline worker and the individual tasked with actually uh, making an affirmative decision on on policy one way or another. We we also have beefed up the reporting requirements to both the governor's office and to the, what's what we call our LOCRA, our Legislative Oversight Commission on Health and Human Resources Accountability. And that's a group of legislators which meet monthly or every time we convene for our, our interim meetings to hear reports from DHHR. Now it will be from all three entities every time we're together on the status of the transition and, and sort of performance audits periodically, N- not necessarily monthly, but no less often than when we meet as a legislature. So every time we convene throughout the year, we'll be hearing a report from each one of those three entities on the status of their progress, achieving the goals that we've set out to achieve here. Mr. So we're, we're, we're hopeful and, and we're, we're pretty encouraged by what we've seen so far. Mr. Speaker, thank you so much for your time this morning.